Never again is a powerful call to remember and learn the lessons of the Holocaust, which claimed six million Jewish lives during World War II. But is it possible the world has misunderstood those lessons? Historian Timothy Snyder's new book, Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning, offers a very different thesis, that we have missed crucial insights from the rise of Hitler and Nazi Germany, and that we might need those insights today as much as ever. Timothy Snyder joins us now from New Haven, Connecticut. He is professor of Central European History at Yale University. And as we welcome you to TVO and are happy that you could spare some time for us, let us remind everybody, professor, that today is the 71st anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the concentration camp in Poland. So let us start with your words about the limits of remembrance. Here's what you had in the New York Times back in September of last year. I worry that the history of the Holocaust, even as it's become more widely acknowledged as important, has also lost some of its sharpness. It's become much less about causes and much more about pictures and remembering and honoring. What honoring leads to is a lot of respectful silence. That has its place, but it doesn't generate knowledge. Okay, first question. For those who think that the Holocaust is the best documented tragedy in the history of the world, what new knowledge do you think there really is to be had about it? That's a great question because I, I think it's important to call that bluff at the very beginning. I, I get asked by reporters and educators all the time why we need one more book on the Holocaust. But if you turn the question around and ask, well, what was the Holocaust? Who died? Who were the killers? And how could such a thing have happened? It's very rare that anyone has a good answer. Some of the basic things aren't known. Most of the victims, for example, were not German Jews. Roughly half of the killers were not Germans. Most of the killers weren't Nazis. Some of the basic elements of Hitler's worldview, his idea that we live in a constant ecological panic, his notion that conventional states should be destroyed, we've forgotten or we've understood exactly backwards. So what I'm trying to do is build up from the beginning a plausible account of how one could go from killing almost no Jews up to 1941 to killing more than five million over the course of the next two and a half years. We do not have a plausible interpretive causal account of how such a thing could have happened. And it seems to me that before we move on to remembering, we have to ask ourselves the question, exactly what are we remembering? The what comes first, and then let's remember. Okay, so much to unpack from that first answer, so let me try here. You used a phrase in there that, um, well, that has caused a, a, a good deal of eyebrows to be raised around the world as people have delved into your book, and that is ecological panic as part of the explanation mm. for what transpired. Just help us understand what you mean by that. It, 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 it might seem like I'm, when I use a phrase like that, that I'm drawing us away from the history of the Jews, but it's exactly the opposite. In order to understand why a Holocaust happened, one has to have a very clear idea of how Hitler thought about the Jews. And in order to understand that, one has to understand how Hitler saw the world. What Hitler believed was there is a real world underneath appearances. In that real world, we all belong to races, and those races should, must be competing for limited resources, above all, fertile land, food. From Hitler's point of view, the only thing which matters is the struggle of races for land. That's why the book is called Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Now, if it seems to you, if it seems to me, if it seems to us, there are other things going on in the world, like laws or states or religions or ethics. This, says Hitler, is all an illusion. This is a kind of superficial reality which has to be stripped away. And there's a particular group of people who are responsible for that superficial false reality, says Hitler, and those people are the Jews. So what Hitler claims is that all we really should be doing is struggling. Laws, norms, ethics, the things that stop us from struggling. A belief in science is another one. These things are Jewish myths. These things are Jewish illusions. And the Jews have to be exterminated so we can go back to our original mission. So there are two basic interesting ideas here. The first is that it's right to desire more because life really is struggled. But Hitler is more sophisticated than that. Hitler is saying that it's also good and natural to want more. 
We need land and food to survive, says Hitler. But also, and this is what's more interesting and closer to us, which is why we like to forget it, Hitler says, it's natural to be a consumer. It's natural to want more and more. It's natural to kill millions of other, other, other people so that you can have your own standard of living. So ecological panic is Hitler's description of the world, but it's also a state of mind. It's a kind of politics which can arise if you say, there are no rules, we should just take what we can get. Well, that does refer us then to the title of the book, Black Earth. What does that refer to specifically? Black, well, it refers to a lumber of things. I mean, like a lot, with a lot of titles, I'm kind of trying to be clever and make references to several things at, at once. Most, most obviously, Black Earth refers to fertile territory, um, the, in particular the Black Earth of Ukraine. The Holocaust had a geography. Most of the Jews who were killed in the Holocaust are killed between Berlin and Moscow, which is where they lived. There's a reason why the war was fought there, chiefly, and that reason is that Hitler's war aim was precisely the Black Earth of Ukraine. Hitler's idea was that if Germany could conquer that fertile territory, it would redeem itself as a race, and as a nation it would become another superpower who could challenge the Americans and the British for dominance in the 20th century. But there's another aspect to this as well. Hitler looked at Ukraine and said, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Communism, says Hitler, like Christianity, like the law, like any form of ethics or politics, is ultimately Jewish. So if you attack eastward, you'll be destroying the Soviet Union. You'll be making a first stride against what Hitler sees as the world hegemony of Jews. But of course, with Black Earth, I mean something besides Ukraine. I mean Ukraine, but I mean a couple of other things. I'm also gesturing towards the way the world might look in the future, that we might be making the world blacker now than it needs to be. I'm gesturing towards a world without life, to be absolutely clear about this. And of course, I'm also referencing a whole poetic and literary tradition. For example, Paul Celan's um, Todesfugue, uh, which has the famous lines about the black, mil the black milk of daybreak that we drink. Hmm. Now, the, the thesis that you're putting forward and some of the conclusions that you have come to, there is considerable controversy there. I want to leave that aside for a second. We'll get to that. But the initial assertions that you made, again, as I circle back to that first answer, that more Jews died outside concentration camps than in them, and some of the other facts you put forward. Among serious Holocaust scholars, is there general agreement on those facts in your view? Yeah, of course. I mean, what, what we have is a tremendous tension between the facts that we all know and the story that we all tell. The two of them don't match up, and this is the basic problem. We all know, that is all scholars and students of the Holocaust, we all know that 97% of the Jews killed in the Holocaust were not German Jews. We all know that the tremendous majority of Jews, almost 100% of the Jews who died in the Holocaust, were killed not in Germany, not in some other authoritarian state, but in zones that German power deliberately rendered stateless. We all know those things. That's the, that's the alphabet of, of the history of the Holocaust. That's what we know, those are the facts. But the story we tell is about Hitler rising to power, about the Nazi party in Germany, and, and, and about, uh, about Germans and German Jews. If you think of a Holocaust victim, at least most of us will think of Anne Frank or Victor Klemper or another German Jew. Um, that story is familiar. We know more about Germany than other countries. We might find German Jews more civilizationally um, accessible to us and other people. For whatever reason, we tell a story about Germany. And that story about Germany can only be part of the history. The Holocaust simply did not happen in Germany between 1933 and 1941. So the Holocaust can't just be about German Jews. It can't just be about German power. It has to be about something else. So how do we bring these facts of this pan-European and especially East European cataclysm together with this story? The way to do it is to think about the story differently. Hitler's rise to power is not about building an authoritarian state. It's chiefly about creating instruments of power that can destroy other states. Hitler's ideology is not simply anti-Semitic prejudice. It's not about discriminating German Jews. It's about describing all Jews as part of an international plot that's going to destroy all of humanity. So if you bring these things together, what one sees is an image which is actually plausible. 
That is, we can't finish the story with Hitler coming to power. We can't even finish the story with the creation of a Nazi state. The Nazi state is not an end in itself. Hitler's not really an authoritarian. He's not really a nationalist. What Hitler is about is building up racial power inside Germany, which can then go east, destroy states in the east, build a colony in the east. And it's in that zone that the general desire to exterminate Jews, which is there from the beginning, can become the practical politics of, of murdering them. So do I understand this right, that in Hitler's ideal world, there is no peace, no order ever to come. It is just nonstop race wars as far as the eye can see? Yes. I mean, this is really important intellectually, and this is why I start out in a very old-fashioned way, actually, with summarizing Hitler's idea. We have a temptation to think Hitler is, is something familiar to us, but just more so. So we say he's an authoritarian, but an extreme one. Or he's a nationalist, but he's an extreme one. He's not really those things. Hitler is a kind of zoological anarchist. He recognizes that there's a German nation, but he doesn't actually care about the German nation. He sees German na nationalism as a political force that can be manipulated to throw the Germans into a larger racial war where they will win their destiny and realize what they actually are. He sees the German state as important. He wants to control its institutions. He wants to make it an instrument, but an instrument of a particular kind of destroying other states beyond Germany. And ultimately, as you say, the goal is to make to give Germans the land and the power they deserve as, as a presumably higher race from Hitler's point of view. But the final goal is to restore the world. And the only way to restore the world is to eliminate the Jews. Because from Hitler's point of view, the Jews cast down upon everyone else a kind of mental haze. He calls it a spiritual pestilence, which prevent, prevents us from seeing the world the way that it actually is. All the things that you and I would agree are real, like contracts or laws, or norms or religions, these things are all illusory. And to get humans back to be the way they should be, ruthless killers whose only solidarity is with their own race. You have to remove the Jews from the world. That's the final goal, and yes, exactly. Once you get there, you'll just have unending racial strife. Um, that's For Hitler, that's the only real thing. Struggle is the only real thing. He says it's a law of nature, as sure of the law of gravity, as sure as the law of gravity. We should be solid, we should have solidarity with our race, and we should kill other races, that's it. What was it about the Jews in particular, though, that, that that made Hitler see them as vermin needing to be exterminated from the face of the earth? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna recast the question slightly because I think it's, it's very important for us when we look at these ideologies to recognize that when people talk about a global force of this kind, they're making sense of the world by inserting a, a piece into it. It doesn't have so much to do with the Jews. It has much more to do with the need to, to make sense of the world. And this is one of the reasons why Mein Kampf and Hitler's thinking should be of interest to us today. Hitler's thinking is a kind of response to globalization. Hitler grew up in the first globalization, just like we grew up in the second globalization. The idea that you have to take what you can get, and the people who tell you not to are Jews and have to be eliminated. Whether we like it or not, that's a response to globalization, and it's one which actually came to power and which changed the world. So as we face the second globalization, it's worthwhile remembering that these kinds of responses are possible. And that leads me to the answer to your question. Um, Hitler looks at other races as inferior. When he looks at Ukrainians, for example, the people who inhabit Ukraine, he looks at them the way colonizers look at people to be colonized. They're not fully human, they're barbaric. Um, Hitler says we can satisfy them by giving them beads, you know, we can play music to them on the weekends and let them dance around poles in their villages. This is his idea about Ukraine. That's the Untermensch idea, the subhuman idea. Hitler's idea about Jews is different. Hitler's idea about Jews is that they span the world. And so the thing about the Jews which does, you know, make this kind of thinking possible is that they're not concentrated onto one territory. Hitler says that that's precisely what's abnormal about Jews. They don't want territory like everyone else does. Instead, they're, they're scattered around the world. And so you have two different kinds of prejudice. But I would, I, would, I would emphasize that one can think of other groups as being global as well, theoretically at least. For example, gays, Muslims, right? You can have other people who are in the position of being a global threat. Logically, it doesn't have to be Jews. Understood. All right. It, well, and actually, it, do, it does dovetail with your with your view, I think you quote Hitler in the book as having said near the end, uh, the Germans deserve to lose to the Russians because the Russians prove themselves stronger. Is that to suggest to you that he cared actually more about power than he did about his own Germany? I, I, whether we like it or not, Hitler seems to have believed his own ideology. So 
Hitler, in my view, and others disagree, in my view, Hitler was not a German nationalist, and he was not someone who cared in a conventional way about the German state. As you follow the course of the war, 42, 43, as the tide of the war turns, you see Germany's allies peel away. You see German allies who had been killing Jews change their policy and cease to kill Jews. Why? Because they're nationalists. They care about their own nation. They may have horrible attitudes about other nations or about Jews, but they want to preserve the nation state, and therefore they're, they're flexible. I'm not praising this, I'm just describing it. Whereas from Hitler's point of view, what's happening is not a war of states against other states. What's happening is a giant purge of humanity, which it's his duty to begin. And in this war, he doesn't particularly care what happens to the state. If the German state ceases to be, so be it. Um, and, and this is where I'm getting to your question. He doesn't really care fundamentally what happens to the German nation because the only truth is struggle. And the only way you can elucidate this, the truth of struggle is to have the struggle. So if it turns out that the Germans lose, that's so much the better. It's just nature working out its natural course. And that's what Hitler actually says as the war comes to an end. He had described the Russians as subhumans to begin, but when the, when the Soviet army wins the war, he says, well, in effect, I was wrong, nature is right, and now the Germans are getting what they deserve. Hmm. Let's talk for a moment about anti-Semitism, because you point out that, say, Polish anti-Semitism versus, let's say, Romanian anti-Semitism versus German anti-Semitism were all different things. How so? Well. I mean, the, 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 there, there is, of course, a whole spectrum of ideas about Jews. Anti-Semitism is not like the volume knob on the radio, you know, where it's just more or less. There can also be a different quality of the idea about the Jews. So some anti-Semites would have, I would say, the more typical attitude of national ethnic cleansers, right? They would say, well, there are foreigners on our land, and we should, ideally, we should get rid of those foreigners. So. A Romanian or a Hungarian or some Polish anti-Semites could look at Jews in that way, which is horrible, right? And it can lead to ethnic cleansing. And in a world of, of, of the 1940s, that ethnic cleansing could mean pushing the Jews towards German-held territory where they would be exterminated, which means that those attitudes could contribute to a Holocaust. Nevertheless, that's different from a view which Hitler seems to have held and a few other Nazis, which says that it's not that the Jews are one more national minority who ideally we would like to deprive ourselves of. It is rather that the Jews are part of a world plot, and therefore they have to be destroyed root and branch. They have to be exterminated. There can't be any Jews left anywhere in order to save the, in order to save the world, they have to be exterminated. That's a different kind of idea. Now, in practice, What's important, I think, is not so much that Germans were different anti-Semites than Poles or Romanians or Hungarians. That's a very complicated question. What's more important is that a specific kind of anti-Semitism actually came to power in Germany. You can't explain Hitler's rise by saying the Germans were more anti-Semitic than other people because they weren't. They weren't more anti-Semitic than, say, the French, but you have very different outcomes. What, what's important is that you have a certain kind of anti-Semitism that's paired to an ideology not of preserving the state, which again can be bad enough, but it's paired to an ideology of anarchy, of destroying other people's states. And it's that combination which actually allows a Holocaust to happen. Let's see if we can better understand the circumstances and the conditions and the locations where Jews were killed in Europe during the Second World War. What did you learn more about that now that you didn't know before? Well, I think the, f the place to start is with the chronology. So we generally start a history of the Holocaust in 1933, which is all well and good. This is when Hitler rises to power. We generally pay attention to the late 1930s as the time when the Second World War starts, which is all very appropriate. Um, and by the time we get to 1941, it's as though all the important things have already happened. But with the chronology, I would stress that Jews are not killed deliberately in very large numbers until 1941. So we have to look very carefully at what happens in 1941. 
what happens in 1941. This is the fundamental, not chronological now, but geographical question. The fundamental thing which happens in 1941 is that Germany invades the Soviet Union. In June 1941, Germany and its allies invade the Soviet Union, the largest military operation in the history of the world. Now that geography is important because it means that German power is now spreading through most of the East European lands where Jews live. And without that basic geographical overlap, German power and Jewish life, you cannot have a Holocaust. But it's, reason, it's, it's important for another reason as well, and this gets us to the politics. It is when Germany invades the Soviet Union precisely that it embarks on a war of destruction against the state which it regards as Jewish. This means that from the very beginning, unlike in Austria, unlike in Czechoslovakia, unlike in Poland, from the very beginning, German forces are killing Jews in large numbers. But the politics are relevant in another way as well. When Germany invades the Soviet Union with its ideology that Jews are communists and communists are Jews, something happens which can't happen elsewhere, namely that non-Jews side with the Germans in order to prove their innocence, to prove that they haven't been part of the Soviet regime which in most cases is false, but to change the past, to line themselves up with the new rulers, they act, at least many do, the way the Germans expect them to act. And so enough of them collaborate with German killers to show that by about the end of 1941 that something like a Holocaust is possible. Then, you know, to answer your general question, the huge majority of Jews who were killed in the Holocaust are either Soviet Jews or, or Polish Jews. Um, and this is because Poland and the Soviet Union are the places where Germany decided to declare that previous political structures were invalid and did not exist. It creates a very special zone, which in the German mind was not even an occupation because there was nothing to occupy. If you compare that to the rest of Europe, what you find is that in these stateless zones, Jews had about a one in 20 chance of surviving. Whereas in places where there was a state, even if it was an allied state, um, even if it was a state under German occupation, even if it was Germany itself, Jews have about a one in two chance of surviving, which is of course horrifying, but it's qualitatively different from one in 20. But let me understand how that is consistent with the experiences in, let's just pick two countries, let's say Holland and let's say Denmark. In Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, they had an exemplary record of saving Jews in Holland uh, where one could argue institutions um, are, are just as sturdy. 75% um, of Dutch Jews perished. So make sense of that for us, if you would. Yeah, this, the, this is a very good way of asking the question. Because if we, if we speak of a Holocaust of European Jews, that's true, but it can blind us to some of the very important national or even regional differences from country to country. Um, what we're tempted to do when we're confronted with national differences is to say, oh, well, those people in country A must have been more anti-Semitic than those people in country B. And what one finds is that that doesn't explain outcomes at all. The Netherlands are a wonderful example. If there was a country in, in interwar, in pre-war Europe, that did not have a problem with anti-Semitism, it was precisely the Netherlands. The Dutch were the only occupied people who actually actively protested anti-Semitic laws under German occupation. Nevertheless, the percentage of Dutch Jews who die, around 75%, is higher than in Romania. Um, it's, that is to say, it's higher than a regime which was a German ally, which had an anti-Semitic policy. It's higher than in Romania. It's about the same as Croatia, which is about as bad as things got outside of the stateless zone. How could that possibly be? And the answer is, the Netherlands were treated, unlike West European neighbors, they were treated much more like an East European occupation. The, the, and the, the crucial thing is, who was in charge of the occupation. In Belgium, in France, in Denmark, which I'll get to, the conventional military authorities were in charge. In the Netherlands, uniquely, it was the SS. Now, this may seem like some kind of decorative detail, but it's hugely important. The SS was a racial institution, not a state institution. Their mission was to destroy conventional political structures and to destroy Jews. Where they were in charge, that tended to happen. In my book, I call them the state destroyers, and it's for this reason. In the Netherlands, they were present. They had many police forces with them. And beyond that, the Dutch government left the scene. The Dutch head of state left the scene. Now, in, in Denmark, where we credit people for, in 1943, carrying out a rescue of Jews, and, and they did, and that's to be praised, 
the situation was very different. Germany had no notion um, of carrying out an, uh, some kind of severely interventionist um, form of occupation in Denmark. It was a very conventional, old-fashioned occupation. The head of state was there, the government was there, the parliament was there. They had democratic elections under German occupation. And in that situation, where state institutions and above all the law remain what it was before, it's very hard to carry out a final solution. So for example, just to give you a kind of detail, when the Germans decide they are going to make uh, Denmark Judenheim, when they are going to get rid of all the Jews, they bring in the commander of police from what was from the Auschwitz district in Poland. And he arrives and he looks around and says, we cannot do it in these circumstances. And he doesn't mean the Danes like Jews and the Poles don't. What he means is there's not the political freedom for maneuver. And this is very important. What the way the Germans set up the occupation in 39, 40, 41 determines what is possible in 41, 42, 43 as the final solution becomes a general policy. So the Germans are unable to carry out um, a, a normal final solution inside Denmark. And what they do, and they do it deliberately, is they let some Danish political leaders know that there's going to be an attempt at a final solution. And those Danish political leaders, along with Danish civil society, organize a flotilla in which the Jews can leave Denmark for Sweden. In which case, in our remaining few moments, let's talk about lessons from then still to be learned today. And I'll start by reading an excerpt here. Um, here we go. There is little reason to think that we are ethically superior to the Europeans of the 1930s and 1940s, or for that matter, less vulnerable to the kind of ideas that Hitler so successfully promulgated and realized. If we are serious about emulating rescuers, we should build in advance the structures that make it more likely that we would do so. So tell us, what are the structures that would help people sustain their empathy under conditions of mortal stress? See, the, 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 the problem with responding to the Holocaust adequately is that an apocalyptic event shouldn't necessarily generate an apocalyptic response. And this is where I think narratively in Hollywood and everywhere else we've gotten this wrong. The way that we narrate catastrophe, whether it's a Holocaust movie or something else, is that something terrible happens and then a few hardy people rescue a few other deserving people. My point in this book, and I devote the last third of it precisely to rescue, and I read a lot of Yiddish and Polish and Russian materials to try to describe what rescue was like in the worst of times and places. My point is, by the time you come to rescue, it's too late. The event is already happening. And the real question is what you can do to eliminate the preconditions of things like this. This is not dramatic, but it's important. Um, and the, the, the two basic answers go to the two basic causes. It's hard to prevent ideologists like Hitler from existing. I would say probably impossible. But what you can do is limit the objective um, corollaries of environmental panic by giving people a sense that there is a future. Right? So supporting science, for example, giving people a sense that there might be more resources in the future or that the climate might calm down in the future because of science. And then just as important or more important is the state. The state doesn't really have any friends in the contemporary world. And for me, this is a kind of moral and intellectual disaster. Indeed, both on the left and on the right, we're, we use the Holocaust as a reason to have less state. For me, this is absolutely backwards. It's a lesson that we've drawn the long way. Um, whether we like it or not, the basic institutions of a state, ideally a rule of law one, but the basic institutions of a state are the things which hold back this kind of catastrophe. In the Holocaust, for a Jew to be killed, that Jew first had to be separated from the state. And once we get that down, we understand how important the state, something that we can take for granted in the West, is for the future. In which case, let's uh, come full circle and finish on an event that took place earlier this month, and that is the release in Germany of Mein Kampf, the book Hitler wrote, his autobiography, in prison back in the 1920s. It sold out on its first day. What do you infer from that? Uh, I, I do not find this that troubling, and I'll tell you why. The, 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 the problems that we have in politics and in human nature that Mein Kampf articulates are there with or without Mein Kampf. I think it's best for us to read Mein Kampf and see what a talented 
and malicious and nihilist politician can do with those psychological and, and, and political potentials um, than it is to ignore Mein Kampf. In Germany, they published it with a, a hugely lengthily footnoted apparatus to put the whole thing in context, to try to deprive it of whatever propaganda sparkle it might still have, which I think was very sound. But I basically see this problem the other way around. I don't think that Mein Kampf you know, is, is going to infect us with its bad ideas. I think rather reading Mein Kampf or knowing what's in it is important for us is important for us so that we can see what kinds of politics might be plausible now. I don't think we're particularly morally or intellectually superior to people in the 1930s. If anything, in certain dimensions like let's say, deferral of gratification, they were probably much better than, than we are. So I think it's important to approach this with humility to try to learn a lesson of the kinds of things that you can head off so that this sort, this sort of appeal to human nature, this appeal to consumption, this appeal to survivalism, to use a contemporary word, um, doesn't come to dominate politics today. And I don't think one has to look very far, whether it's you're looking at the states or whether you're looking at Western or Eastern Europe, to see they were edging in the wrong direction. Well, that does, uh, I mean, I, I can't leave it there. That does provoke a, a final follow-up, which is, um, you know there are plenty of people today who see echoes in Nazi Germany of the 20s and 30s in your presidential campaigns uh, in your country today. Uh, what's your view on whether or not those analogies ought to be pressed too far? It depends on how you make them. I mean, we, we have a default, unfortunately, of saying like, you, you know, you're a good guy up to the moment when you're Hitler, right? I mean, we, it, has to, it has to be a bit more descriptive and historically grounded than that. I would say like, rather than saying this guy or that guy is like Hitler, um, which is a bit our default, we might say rather that there are certain kinds of appeals, which we know from the 1920s and 1930s. There are certain kinds of conditions, like globalization, this is not the first globalization. This is the second one. The first one was 1870 to, let's say, 1940. And from that, we learn how politics, national populism, fascism, national socialism, that kind of politics where you, where you take generic problems of globalization and you blame them on specific groups, whether those are groups who cross the border and take your job um, or whether those are groups who are supposedly you know, directing the whole thing from whatever, from New York or the United Nations. You blame the, the objective problems of globalization on groups. That's a kind of politics which you know from the 1920s and 1930s. So I think it's appropriate to say, look, this kind of thing has been done before and let's ask ourselves where it leads. I think knowing about the 20s and 30s and 40s is useful in that way probably more useful than saying this guy is the closest to Hitler, you know, or this guy is the closest mm. to Hitler. And I don't say that to minimize the dangers. I mean, what strikes me about American exceptionalism is that it prevents us from learning lessons um, basically anywhere because we always think that everything that happens is happening for the first time in our country. And of course, that's generally not the case. Exactly. Uh, Professor Snyder, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. The name of the book is Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning. Thanks so much for joining us from New Haven, Connecticut. It's been a great pleasure and I'm appreciative. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.